So then, um, we continue again. So, with the, um, we're trying to give a little bit of the, you know, the history of, um, of time, the history of the church, and uh, that one of the principal points we're trying to emphasize is that Christ is the King and the Lord of history. Our Lord Jesus Christ is in control of all time, and He rules all of history, and that every moment is controlled by Him. We have free wills. We can choose to go against God. We can choose to disobey God. But we can never stop Him from fulfilling His plan. As we mentioned yesterday at the beginning that uh, we look at the death of Jesus Christ and the birth of Jesus Christ and you see that our Lord, when He was born and our Lord, when He died, He had control of the whole thing, the whole, the whole situation. And as the things that happen in the life of Christ, in His physical life, so the same things must happen in the life of his mystical body. So that, uh, remember that at the beginning God created the world in perfect order, and then Adam and Eve decided to, Adam decided to sin, bring wickedness into the world, then God decided to redeem the world, and send his only begotten Son. After the seven ages of the Old Testament, matching the seven days of the first week of the world, and then seven ages of the New Testament. And we have to go through, we did not go to the seven ages of the Old Testament. The seven ages of the Old Testament would be very helpful to see the seven ages of the New Testament. So we only did the, 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 the six days of creation, and then that matches the seven ages of the New Testament, but in, in between are the seven ages of the Old Testament. So let's, let's try to put them in here. Taken primarily from Bartholomew's Holzhauser. So this board would work better the other way. But the six days, let's go across the top here. The first, the first day, second day, third, fourth, fifth, sixth. Let's see if we can fit it on this small board here. And we have to attach the other board to it. So the first day was light and the void earth. Light and darkness. This is the age of the first revelation. And in the New Testament, See if we can fit it here in this a little small blackboard. <laughs> so the Old Testament, six days, and then the seventh day, the final day of the rest. And then the New Testament, the same. We are now in the fifth age of the New Testament. But we'll see the mirroring, mirroring uh, how the ages are similar. And very often when you see the picture in the Old Testament, you can already see how it fits into the New Testament. Because remember that St. Jerome says that every, every uh, page of the Bible of the Old Testament has Jesus Christ on it. Every page has Christ in it. And also, there are so many types in the Old Testament. Now remember a type. The word type. It's one of the words all Catholics should know. Just put it here at the bottom. A type, T-Y-P-E, type. A type is a real historical event that truly happened in the Old Testament. It's a real historical event. It's not a parable or a story. It's a genuine historical event. But this event is not only real history, it also is a symbol of something of the New Testament. For instance, Noah and the ark. Noah and the ark. Noah was a real man. All of us are the descendants of Noah. 
You are the descendant of Noah. I am the descendant of Noah. And every human being on earth can all point to Noah as our great-grandfather. Noah and his three sons and their wives are the only ones who survived the flood, which covered the entire world. And we see evidence of this worldwide flood here in India. In, and uh, the, the story of it is contained everywhere throughout the whole of the history of the world, every place on earth. And we are all descendants of uh, the uh, Noah, who eventually settled in, in, uh, shortly after he came down from the mountain of Ararat. The oldest city now on earth is basically Baghdad, going down to Baghdad in Iraq. And from Iraq, people migrated to the entire earth. Some migrated in the direction of India. Others migrated up over to China and then the United States from the top. Others migrated to Europe and to Africa and then across Spain and to South America. And from Iraq, which is called the cradle of civilization, all men came, all of us. And we can trace our ancestors going back to those places because Noah was a real man. And Noah really built an ark. And the flood truly covered the entire world. It's a genuine historical event which was caused by the sins of man, by the power of God, and all humanity was wiped out except for those eight people. That is, however, a type of the New Testament in which the ark signifies the Catholic Church. Anyone who is outside of the Catholic Church drowns in sin. And anyone who is outside, and everyone who is outside the Catholic Church is going to be damned. Everyone. And so the revelation of the, of the, the truths of history of the Old Testament signify the realities of the New Testament. So Joseph and Abraham, all of these symbols of various aspects of our Lord Jesus Christ in his life. But they are true historical events. And they mirror each other, showing that God has the complete control over history, as we mentioned yesterday. So the first age of the Old Testament, matching the coming of the light, which is the first revelation, and the void earth, so that the original, the basic revelation is there. This is the revelation to Adam. And it's the period from Adam to Noah. From Adam to Noah. The first period. And in this first period, we have the first sin, the first heretics, the first enemies of God. And in fact, you have all sins that exist in the world today exist at this time. Remember that... that um, uh, our Lord said, at the end of the world, the world will be as wicked as in the days of Noah. So just as men were very wicked in the days of Noah, so it will be at the end of the world. This is Jesus Christ speaking as God. Remember that Jesus Christ, our Lord Jesus Christ, is a real man who is God. And he knew he was God, and he used his divine power, and he spoke as God always. He was the one who created Noah and created Adam. And he said, as the world was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the end of the world. We are now in days very similar, very much like unto the days of Noah. Because in the days of Noah, not only did the sons of men, who were the sons of Cain, abandon God, but the sons of God abandoned God. They're those who are the sons of Abel, and those who are the sons of the faithful Abel, I mean not Abel, but Seth, the sons of, 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 of Seth, they were all turning to wickedness. So much so that God came down at the time of Noah, 100 years before the flood, and he came down and he saw that Noah was the only one who had grace before God. And that all of the others had turned away from God. And when the Lord Jesus Christ says, it will be like in the days of Noah, 
One of the signs of the days of Noah is that not only are the wicked men wicked, as we mentioned yesterday, but also the good men will also be wicked. It's one of the signs of the end times. The wicked men will be wicked, as always, but the good men will also be wicked. So that those who appear to be good will in fact be evil. So much so that as our Lord said, the day will come when they will throw you out of the churches, thinking they do a service to God. These are our times. The same kind of thing happened in the days of Noah. And the only solution that God gave was to wipe out the human race by a flood. We will find a similar solution in our time. So the Adam to Noah. In the New Testament, this was the period of the apostles. The first revelation. The second period is the second match of the second day of creation, which is the day of the division of the waters. The waters above and the waters below. The division of the waters. So the second day is the age of Noah. Until we get to Abraham. The time of the division. Remember that Noah had the true religion. One thing you must recognize. Modern liars, who are called scholars. They're not scholars, they're idiots. Modern liars tell you that the Hindu religion... And that other pagan religions are older than the true religion. This is a lie, and they know it's a lie. It is absolute stupidity. It's completely false. Remember that God created Adam. And Adam was my father and the father of every one of you. And the father of all men on earth. Later on, he created Noah, who was a great-great-grandson, who was also my father and your father and the father of everyone on earth. And Noah held the same religion that we hold. Noah was a Catholic. Noah was a Catholic of the Old Testament. What did Noah believe? Noah knew that he was created by God. Noah knew that the God would become man. And that that God would become man would be one of his own grandchildren. Would be of his own blood. And he knew that there was no other way to get to heaven except by believing and following God made man who would be his own grandson. In believing in the Messiah. He knew there was no other way to heaven. And he had the example that those who did not follow God they were all killed. They were killed by God in the flood. And God told Noah that he will must, we must make thanks to God and prepare for the coming of Christ. So Noah had the true religion. But what happened? His children turned away from God. Just like Adam's children turned away from God. Ham turned away from God. The majority of the Sims, the sons of Sim, were turned away from God. Japheth turned away from God. And their children turned away from God. And what happened? Abraham was faithful several hundred years later. And Abraham, about 400 years after the flood, 500 years after the flood, Abraham was called by God to be the father of the chosen people. And what happened during the second age it was the age of the division. The age of the separation. And this second age of the separation is also the age of the second age of the church, which was the age of the martyrs. If you were a follower of Christ in the first 300 years, you were put to death. Father uh, Francis, uh, Father Giselle, Father Francis used to be here also with myself here in India. He was just speaking a, a week ago in a sermon on St. Pius the First. And he says, you know, the trouble of the church today is that there are no more normal bishops. 
There are no more normal priests. Because, you know, when you became a priest in the New Testament, you would be killed for the faith. If you became a bishop in the New Testament, such as the twelve apostles were bishops, you would be killed for the faith. And if you were a pope, the first popes for the first 300 years, every one of them was killed for the faith. And so imagine you're going to become a priest in the year 100 A.D., or you're going to become a bishop in the year 100 A.D., or you're going to be elected pope in the year 100 A.D. All of them knew, I must shed my blood for the truth. That's a normal bishop. That's a normal priest. That's what God intended for us. That we would shed our blood standing for the truth. That's the way it's supposed to be. But somehow, over the last several hundred years, there has entered a lot of uh, corruption. And this, somehow what has happened is that uh, over this time, we started to get special privileges for being a bishop and being a priest. And we forgot that what a priest is, what a bishop is, what a follower of Christ is. One who is ready always to shed his blood for the truth. This is the age of division. God called Abram away from Ur of Chaldees. You must leave Ur of Chaldees. And you, I will give you another land. Just like when we are baptized, we are called away from the life of sin and away from the wicked life into a new life. A new kingdom. So we can also match these seven ages to the seven sacraments. We can match these seven ages to the seven stages of the life of the Catholic. And we can match them to the seven virtues that God wants us to practice. Because but that is the three theologic virtues of faith, hope, and charity. And prudence, justice, temperance, and fortitude. God made a beautiful universe. Look at the world around us. We have green trees. And we have stars that are really hot. And we have animals and plants. And they are so very different. And yet, they all work in perfect harmony. They work in perfect harmony. They go together perfectly because that's how God made things. So likewise, he made the history of man. And that history of man is in perfect harmony. He knows how to make all of it fit together. My individual life, the life of my family, the life of my church, the life of my country, and the life of the entire world all fits together in one beautiful divine book. So Abraham goes aside as the martyrs went aside. And then the third age is the age of the dry land. Remember our two great symbols, light, the giving of revelation and grace, and the rocks, the ground, which is doctrine, standing on clear doctrine. We stand on the rock of clear teaching. That's the strength of the Catholic faith, the strength of the apostles. That we stand on the truth. So when we go to the third day, on the third day of creation, God made the dry land to appear. Now it was already there. It was underwater. It was already there. But then God pulled it out and made it appear. And this is in the great teaching. And of course the great teacher of the third age is Moses. Moses. Moses is the one that God will give the Ten Commandments on the, uh, you know, on the mountain of Sinai. And he will lay out the teaching of the, of the Pentateuch. Moses writes with his own hand the first five books of the Bible. The modernists don't accept that. They don't like that. They don't want to believe that Moses wrote those books. But he did. Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible. He wrote the book of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, 
Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And he wrote them by the inspiration of God, and they became the first works of sacred scripture, by which God spoke through the ears and, and, and mind of Moses, and Moses wrote down these sacred words, which are the word of God, and they are infallible and inerrant, and they cannot in any way be questioned. Every word that Moses wrote was true. And modern fools tell you, Moses followed the tradition of the Babylonians. He did not. It's a lie. The Babylonians were sons of Noah who abandoned the truth and corrupted the true revelation. Thereby they took part of this into their lies and other parts they invented Whereas Moses kept the true, the truth, and Moses kept the only truth. Remember that when you belong to the Catholic Church, you belong to the church that was founded by God the day that He created Adam. And when He created Adam, He breathed in the divine grace and the divine truth. And this church is the church that was in its Old Testament phase between Adam and the coming of Christ. Now it is in the New Testament phase between the first coming of Christ and the second coming of Christ. And God is the Lord of all history. One thing, for instance, we've always disliked as Catholics, you never find it in olden times. And that is this belief that there is church history and there is sort of civil history. There's a history of India, and then there's a history of America, and then there's a history of this and a history of that, as if these histories are divided. They are not. There is only one history, and that is the history of man created by God for the glory of God and under the dominion of God fighting against Satan. That's history. And that battle happens in India, and it happens in America, and it happens in every island on the planet. It happens in Antarctica and the North Pole, and everywhere in between. There is only one history, and the great history book, the first one written by God, is called Sacred Scripture, the Bible. It is a history book, the story of the real reality of the life of man from the time of his creation until the time that Jesus Christ comes to judge the living and the dead at the end of the world. So the third age, age of Moses, the age of the doctrine, it is the age of the fathers of the church in the New Testament. St. Augustine, St. Ambrose, the great teachers that explained to us the doctrine that was already there. Just like that water, that rock was not new, it was under the water, in the time of Moses, it came out of the water and it became visible to the people. And Moses explained the true religion to the people. So likewise, in the New Testament, Ambrose and Augustine and, and uh, John Chrysostom and all the great saints, the fathers of the church, all these great fathers of the church, they explained the doctrine that was already there. It was given to us by the apostles already and they just gave a an explanation of it to make it easier for us to understand and more clear for us. So from Abraham to Moses and then the fourth age is the age of the great glory. This is the age of glory because it's the age of the sun, the moon, and the stars. The age of glory. This age is right in the middle. The key man in this age of the Old Testament is Solomon. And this is the age from, well you can say there from Abraham, uh, Noah to Abraham, Abraham to Moses. Then we go from uh, Moses to uh, the Babylonian captivity. It's the year 596 B.C. Five hundred and ninety six years before Christ began the Babylonian captivity, which marks the end, the end of this period. 
and this the age of the glory going from uh, let's see uh, yeah well I'm not that over does it you do the old So then, um, the um, the age of glory, going from uh, until this is called the Babylonian captivity. Now we can't write it out. The Babylonian captivity. The Babylonian captivity was between 596 and 536 BC. Seventy years. During those seventy years. The Jews were taken out of Israel and they were brought into Babylon. It was a great time of conflict in the whole of ancient Israel. And we find a difference between the Jews previous to this period and the Jews afterwards. There was, a, there was what the moderns would call a paradigm shift. What modern people would call it nowadays. There was a paradigm shift. There was a complete change between the Jewish man and the man of God before this captivity and the man of God afterwards. Something changed deeply inside of man. Inside of the Jewish man in the Old Testament and inside of the Christian man in the New Testament. This was a very important break. Now, before in the Old Testament, before the Babylonian captivity, whenever Jews sinned, they just went off and worshipped a false god. Remember that they were always worshipping Baal and Moloch. They were building temples of the false gods. They always had a problem with idolatry. And in fact, we can say this. The Jews before 596, they were better than the Jews after. And to the eyes, they were worse than the Jews after. But in fact, they weren't worse. But it was more visible. Because you see, in the old days, you either followed God or you followed the devil. Man was a lot more clear. He either followed the false gods, like the gods of the Hindus, or he followed the true God and he made a decision. And one of the mysteries of this time is that during this great age of glory, during the great age of glory, there was another movement. During the great age of glory of the Old Testament, Solomon was in his glory. But what did God say to Solomon? Solomon, I am unhappy with you. God was angry with Solomon because Solomon built false temples. Remember, Solomon had a thousand wives, and many of them did not come from Israel. And God told him, I told you you could have many wives. But why did you choose the women who were pagans? Why did you choose these evil women? And then, in order to please these women, you built temples to their God. So one of the mysteries of this age of glory is that there came a time in the age of glory where there was another movement, and that is the movement away from God at the same time that God is in His strength and glory in the Old Testament. God allowed there to be a great glory under Solomon because He loved David. Because of the love of David. And because of the love of David... And because of the, how great David is, I will allow you to have an age of great glory. But do not think I'm happy with you, says God to Solomon. I will punish you in your children. Now, the same thing will happen in the New Testament. We will find a double movement in the age of glory in the New Testament. 
The age of glory in the New Testament is from about 500 to 1517. 1517 was the day that Martin Luther, when he nailed his theses, 95 theses, on the wall of the, of the door of the Cathedral of Wittenberg. You'll notice this is 1,000 years. 1,000 years. Now remember that sacred scripture tells us that there will be a thousand years of glory. Now there's a heresy called Chileism or Millenarianism. This heresy came up in the year 1000 and it's come back in the year 2000. Same heresy. In the year 1000, the first millenarianists, this simply means 1000, or Chileism, which I guess means the same thing, they said the first thousand years from the time of the death of Christ until, until the, uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, until the year 1000 was the age of the Son. The Old Testament was the age of the Father. Now it's the age of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost age is described by the Beatles as all you need is love. Everybody likes the age of the Holy Ghost. That's the age of the Spirit, the age of partying, the age of feeling good, the age in which we don't have to do penance anymore. It's the age, like they say in America, of good times and great oldies. It is the age of partying. Now that's what they that's what some heretics basically taught in the year 990, but they had to make it look good. It's a spiritual age. We got to be spiritual. What do they mean by being spiritual? It means you don't have to do penance. Because that's physical. You don't have to go to mass on Sunday cuz you got to walk all the way over to mass. You don't have to be faithful to your wife because after all, there's more women to love. And you don't have to follow any of the Ten Commandments. So, but they call it the age of the Holy Ghost. This heresy has come back in the year 2000. And it's a heresy that was actually spoken of, it's a heresy of Vatican II, one of the heresies of Vatican II, that we are in a new age, the age of the Father is finished, and the age of the Son is finished, now we are in the age of the Holy Spirit, and the Spirit blows wherever it wants. This Spirit is spoken of by St. Paul, he's called Satan. The spirit of Lucifer. He says there are principalities and spirits of wickedness in high places. That is what they call the Holy Spirit. In fact, nowadays it's a good test. If somebody says they believe in the Holy Spirit, that's all you need to hear. If they believe in the Holy Spirit, they are following Satan. This heresy came up in the year 1000. And the church fought against it and defeated it through great saints. And there arose the great glory of Christendom. Just like in the days of Solomon, there was a great glory in the Old Testament. So there's a great glory in the New Testament. And this is called the Middle Ages. They are the ages of faith. You will go to Europe. The end of the Middle Ages, you see here. All the beautiful early Baroque churches that you see here in Goa, they are the product of the end of the Age of Glory. In fact, you can tell the difference. Look at St. Anne's Church. Look at the Bon Jesus. And look at the new church in Panjim. Well, what's it called? The church in... Uh, when they left Bon Jesus. The church on the hill. Immaculate Conception. Immaculate Conception. Look at the difference between those churches. It's still a beautiful church. 
These churches built in the 1900s, in the 1800s, in the 1700s. They still have a certain beauty to them, and the people that built them have the faith. But when you walk into a church that was built in the 1500s, and you walk into a church that was built in the 1400s, you can tell the difference. This was the age of the glory of the Catholic faith. There is something more glorious, something more beautiful about the uh, cathedral and the St. Francis Church, the St. Anne's Church, that isn't there. And even these more modern churches that are still Catholic and beautiful, there's something less in them. The glory of the church began to go away in the year 1500. In that century, it finished its spread of faith throughout the world. And when you get to the year 1600, there begins to be a declining away from the faith. And this is the age spoken of by Jesus Christ in the New Testament. He calls it the age of apostasy. You see it in the animal, in the plants. A flower grows to its maximum beauty. And then what? It rots. One of the mysteries of God's creation that He made things grow to their maximum beauty. And then they rot. The girl becomes magnificently beautiful and then she has to take oil of Olay. Then she has to take anti-wrinkle stuff and she has to do go and have her skin lifted. She has to do all kinds of things that she doesn't have to do when she's 14. You reach the maximum beauty and then the corruption begins. That's the nature of things since the original sin of Adam. So it's, it's it we see in the age of in the Old Testament, we get to this 596 BC. And there's a change. Something happens to the Jewish people. Something changes in them. And they, they used to be very bad and very good. Afterwards, you will find they're not. In fact, if we can apply a virtue to this last age, we can call it the virtue of mediocrity. Something happened. The Jews before, they were saints or they were devils. You look at the Portuguese that came here. They were some of the greatest men that ever walked the earth. And they were really good or they were really bad. And you can't find one who was just a reasonably nice guy to kill people once in a while. They were really good or they were really bad and they couldn't tolerate mediocrity. They just couldn't tolerate it. In this sense, the world was so much better before than what it is now. So much better. And God speaks about this also. In the book of Genesis it says, in the days of Noah, before Noah, now remember, there were 1,000 656 years between the day that God created Adam and the very beginning of time with the six days of creation and the day of the flood. Exactly 1,656 years. The years are recorded in the book of Genesis. In the early period, it says in the book of Genesis, those were the days of great men when noble deeds were done. There was an age of great men. And the age of great men ended. And we ended into an age of weaklings and wimps. And those are the ones who Christ would kill before the flood. Remember what Jesus Christ said. I would that you were hot or cold. But if you are lukewarm... I will begin to vomit you out of my mouth. Remember when you begin to vomit, that's when you feel the worst. That's, that is when you feel the absolute worst. There's a relief when the vomit is finished. 
That's why Jesus Christ says, our Lord says, I, if you are lukewarm, I will begin to vomit you out of my mouth. I would that you are hot or cold, good or evil, but do not be in between. The great example <clears throat> that we see in the sacred scripture is Pilate. Pilate, we mention him very often on retreats. Pilate, when you look at the, the, the characters of the Passion, Annas, Caiaphas, Herod, and Pilate, you have to admit between those four leaders, Annas the priest, though he was not the real high priest, he was therefore a representative of all false religions. Caiaphas, who was also a priest, but he was the real high priest, therefore he represented the true religion. Pilate, who was a leader who crucified Christ, but he was a true leader of Rome, therefore he represented true authorities. And Herod, who was also a king, but he had no authority in Jerusalem, therefore he represented all false authorities. So you've got four characters. Uh, Annas, Caiaphas, uh, Pilate, and Herod. Now, supposing you had to have dinner with one of them, which one would all of us choose? Pilate. Mm -hmm. Pilate was a nice guy. Pilate was, you know, he had a warm heart. Pilate tried his best. We would be, we, we empathize with Pilate. And even our Lord Jesus Christ says to Pilate, you have not committed the greatest sin. Those who handed me over to you have committed the greatest sin. That is Caiaphas and Annas. So even our Lord says Caiaphas is more wicked than Pilate. Annas is more wicked than Pilate. But consider the crucifixion. Imagine that Herod was the one in charge. We know exactly what Herod would do because once before a girl danced in front of Herod and asked for the head of John the Baptist on a dish. In five minutes she had the head on the dish. Though Herod liked John the Baptist, it tells us in the Gospel, Herod was sad because he kind of liked St. John. And so he was sad for about 15 seconds. And then he said, chop his head off. And so they chopped his head off. So imagine that Herod was there at 6 o'clock in the morning when Caiaphas and Annas and the mob came with Jesus Christ. They said, we want him to be crucified. Herod would say, no, but I like him. He's a nice man. We want him to be crucified. All right, I got to eat breakfast. I don't want to be disturbed because it's almost time for my breakfast. And so therefore, crucify him. Just go out and crucify him. I want him dead before nine. And our Lord Jesus Christ would not have been mocked by being in front of another king, Herod. He would not have been scourged. He would not have been crowned with thorns. He would have not had the embarrassment of being crucified between two thieves. And he would not have had the mockery placed over the top of his cross Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. He wouldn't have been put on stage to let the people vote between the innocent creator of the universe and a pig. And the people voted for the pig. They voted for Barabbas. None of those things would have happened if only Pilate was just an evil man. But because Pilate was not evil, our Lord Jesus Christ suffered infinitely more. This is the hallmark of this fifth age. It's the age of Pilate's. <laughs> the age of mediocrity. The age of souls walking away from God. And the ones that call themselves good, what are they called? They're called the Pharisees and the Sadducees. It was at the same time, after the Babylonian captivity, 
that the um, Pharisees rose up. And so there is a transformation that happens. And the Jews stop having idolatry. But they start to change their view of Christ. In the New Testament, Catholics stop leaving the Catholic Church. And they start to change the church from within. Just like the Jews in the Old Testament still claim to be Jews. They still claim to be the people of the Messiah. They still believe that they were ready to follow the Messiah. But they changed their idea of the Messiah through the inspiration of Satan. So that when the Messiah came 500 years later, they rejected him. They rejected him. And so the same thing will happen in the New Testament, which is what we're going through right now. And uh, we'll go ahead and take a break here for 10, 15 minutes, and we'll start again in a little break. So we'll just say a quick prayer, and then we'll take a little, a little break here. Father, Son, Glory be to the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. St. Vincent Ferrer. St. Jude. Lady of Victory. Lady of Sorrows. Lady of Christians. St. Ignatius.